So the title of the talk is The Case for Paratopian Design. And all of this thinking grew out of an FRQSC funded research creation project called Speculative Play. And that project was about merging together two schools of design thought, playful media and game design on the one hand and speculative and critical design on the other. How might we, we leverage playful and digital interactions to bring complex social and cultural questions to life? And can you do this in a way that brings experiences to people beyond universities, galleries, and the ivory towers that our community has ready access to? But this is jumping the gun. We can't answer that question without thinking through what speculative and critical design entail, which I'll do in the form of an ordered series of propositions. So, one, speculative and critical design, or SCDs, propose alternative visions of the world through object rhetoric. The thinking is that by drawing attention to alternative visions, people will end up critically thinking about how the world currently is. Because SCDs frequently take the form of objects, the manifestation or evocation of possible worlds is expressed through the functionality that, that is proposed by these objects. Best practice advice for speculative and critical design suggests that there's a sweet spot for contextualizing or situating an experience. The space between familiar and unfamiliar. Too familiar and the concept will be understandable but boring. Too unfamiliar and the concept might be interesting but irrelevant. And my term for this Goldilocks spot is the uncanny design valley. To be clear, normally best practice advice is to avoid the uncanny valley, but in the case of SCDs, it's actually beneficial. With SCDs, you want to target an uncanny valley outside of here and now, which is made uncanny because it includes modifications and edits to facts, the course of science, cultural and societal norms, laws and rules, or the perspectives that history is told through. When experiencing an SCD, people shouldn't feel totally out of place, but they should feel like they're on the back foot. And as learning science has argued, when we feel unsure, we're more motivated to pay attention and engage in critical thinking. And the term design prototype doesn't quite suffice here either, because design prototypes are often understood as interim tools as opposed to final propositions. And this is exactly why my collaborator Pippin Barr and I started wondering about games and playful media as vehicles for SCDs. With games, we can use expressive interactivity to convey and simulate functions in the context of game world fictions. So both function and fiction can be bound together. And depending on platforms and technical requirements, access and circulation can be fairly wide. So in 2017, Pippin released It Is As If You Were Doing Work, or simply work. And work conveys functions within a fiction. It presents itself as an application to give a sense of purpose to the idle humans of a near future in which all work has been delegated to robots. And it takes the form of a 90s Windows style desktop environment with office like tasks to be performed through the manipulation of standard UI elements. So work is an SCD motivated by the question of what is work for if it's no longer about getting things done. Let's move on to design dystopias and specifically to NeoCub, which is a dystopian SCD that I designed with my project team. I live in Quebec, which happens to have legislation in place that bans niqab, which is the full face cover that some Muslim women wear. 
And as a Muslim woman living in Canada, it's a political issue that I have personal stakes in. So neocarb is an experience that poses questions about how we deal with religious diversity in secular Western countries. The fiction of neocarb presents a dystopian technology for cultural and religious tolerance, but it mostly targets Muslim women who wear niqab. The neocarb technology enables censoring and, in a sense, uncensoring of people whose faces are covered. So you can force a face onto someone who didn't want to be seen. And we simulated this function using a connect, projection, and a swipe-based mobile UI. And the rhetorical intention here is not to convince people that this is an effective product or even a good idea. It's to make people reflect on their community and society's stance towards visible religious difference and our own boundaries regarding tolerance. And the, the rhetoric operates at a visceral and experiential level as well. People have to literally edit away someone's face as they stand near them. There's no hiding behind the law and that's just how we do things. The design intention is to make what is mandated at the legislative societal level be enacted at the individual level. I want to reiterate, what we propose through Neocarb is a terrible solution. I'm not advocating that we make this thing real. It's most definitely dystopian design. And I'll be the first to admit, dystopian design is fun, but it's irresponsible. And it means that we leave the burden of articulating alternatives on the shoulders of our audiences, which is, you know, arguably kind of lazy. Okay, so if we're avoiding dystopias, what do we have left? I mean, we probably don't want to de design utopias because those are impossible, doomed to fail. So what's left? Well, fortunately, all the space in between. Okay, so lateral alternatives and possible parallel wor worlds. For argument's sake, let's call those paratopias. And then it struck me, new idea, you play someone who has to critically analyze and reflect on Neocarp, to which Chip responded, that I can do. And as uncomfortable as that exchange was, it's how I started thinking about onboarding design as applied to SCDs. So Neocarb now gets presented as an app that has been submitted to a fictional distribution platform called PocketNet. A useful metaphor for thinking about this type of onboarding is an airlock. Airlocks are sealed off compartments between environments of differing pressure conditions. They have doors to the different environments that do not open at the same time, and they have seals. And a lock helps its inhabitants acclimate to the environment that they're about to enter. So if locks are about acclimatization, then we can ask, what do you need your design audience to know and to assume? Who do you need them to be? And how do you assist the blurring of their everyday identity with their diegetic role? Well, it turns out that LARPers deal with blurring of identity all the time. So here's the fastest and loosest introduction to role-playing theory you're ever going to encounter because I'm just about to borrow their terminology. Okay, so within LARP circles, people talk about bleed when there's a carryover of experience either from player to LARP character or from LARP character to player. And the classic example of bleed is the LARP crush or emotional bleed. If anyone mentions bleed, of course they'll think of blood, but ink is another substance that famously bleeds. So consider what happens when you hold an inky pen down on paper. Something like that, right? Especially if your paper is thin. So 
the wisdom of fountainpenlove.com tells us bleeding occurs when ink soaks through a piece of paper to the other side ink might soak through onto the next piece of paper or even the surface you're writing on and this turns out to be quite a nice metaphor for explaining larp bleed if ink is analogous to the play experience and paper is the boundaries of the magic circle I bring out the magic circle because it roughly overlaps with another very important LARP concept, which is alibi. Alibi is more complicated to explain than bleed, so allow me to unleash a definition from the Nordic LARP wiki. So, alibi can include individual legitimizing strategies which enable players to interact and reconstruct a socially acceptable spectrum of play. So it's a negotiation of what is acceptable to do in a certain LARP. And the same page proposes, alibi is what makes the player able to do the LARP, but also what legitimizes his actions after the LARP to the world and to himself. We agreed it was okay to do X, so it is okay that I did it. Alibi and bleed are oppositional and complementary. So bleed is your day-to-day -day self melding into the play experience, and alibi is what allows you to play in ways that don't conform to your ideas of you. The stronger your alibi, the less likely you'll experience bleed, and the weaker your alibi, the more likely you'll experience bleed. All right, lesson over, but the main point, bleed and alibi are useful design tools especially for thinking through diegetic framing in SCDs. SCDs can be about anything at all, so long as they're not too far away from here, or here and now, or what is familiar. In any SCD, there should be residual thought about the diegetic world after experiencing it. If the character you set up for your audience or players is fairly innocuous, or the diegetic assumptions aren't obviously offensive, you can get away with dropping audience members into the diegetic world, but keep the idea of threads in mind. Make the designed experience familiar enough that your audience can intuit what to do. Alibi here is weak, so some degree of bleed is likely. If, however, your diegetic assumptions are provocative or difficult, design for onboarding and acclimatize your audience in a design airlock. And this acclimatization should give your audience an alibi. You can still have a core design experience that gets people to explore difficult scenarios, but now it happens between onboarding and offboarding phases. Spontaneously occurring bleed will be weaker, but the alibi you provide helps compensate for bleed. And as all good serious game designers know anyway, you will magnify and multiply the effects of any diegetic learnings when you include something like a post-play debrief session. Theme. All right, so one, SCDs propose alternative visions of the world through the lens of objects. They grow best in uncanny design valleys, places that are somewhat estranged from here and now. They operate in the context of particular fictions and can be misinterpreted outside of those fictions. It's often difficult to experience an SCD's function for various pragmatic reasons, which is why games and interaction design inspired SCDs are really promising. Though, games normalize weird and that's not necessarily helpful for SCDs. All right, next, dystopias are common in SCDs, but straight dystopias don't leave much room for dialogue. Paratopias, or paradigm-shifted presence, give us a diegetic target that moves us out of the dystopic, uh, utopia binary. And paratopian design can be tethered to here and now via threads in the form of engagement with existing technical or design standards. Participatory design likewise um, invokes threads in the form of audience lived experience. But threads alone aren't always enough, especially if your diegetic context is provocative. 
And in these cases, please uh, consider using onboarding design. And last but not least, last and perhaps most, in SCDs, you always want bleed. And if you can't have it, then you need an alibi.